I do not believe that hardly a time of our assembling together do we have prayer without someone praying for this nation. We love our nation. There's nothing wrong with being an American. We all recognize that God comes first. We all know from Matthew 6.33 that our Lord taught that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. But what I want to speak on today is how can we, and I, I mean we, I mean Christians, members of the Lord's Church, how can we help this nation? Now, I could be in Russia, I could be in Singapore, I could be in Taiwan or wherever I might be in any other nation. I could pose that same question. Because the kingdom of Christ is throughout the world. I think Solomon was very clear when he wrote in Proverbs 14 and verse 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation. We've mentioned several times in class, and I've heard Ken mention it in the classes he's taught, how that we individually and personally must give account to God for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. But also that God holds nations into account, and those of us studying Isaiah have clearly seen that that's the case as Isaiah prophesies not only about Israel, but about all the nations round about them at that time. And when you read Romans chapter 13 or anything about, either explicitly in just so many words or implicitly what the Bible teaches, concerning civil government in nations, then we're able to see that civil government's ordained of God, that civil government certainly do not always, and maybe most of the time they don't, do all they ought to do, and they're not all what they ought to be. And some, like the Nazi government, communist governments, have been so far away and even in opposition to godly principles. But I don't think any of them could be any worse than was the Roman Empire in the first century to where the government at different times actually opposed outright Christianity. And if you study the Roman Empire, you see that that waned and surged at different times. You might have one emperor who was tremendously opposed to Christianity, and he'd be there a few years, and things would really be tough. And then when he died and somebody else took over, he would let up on the persecution. But nevertheless... We've all studied enough to know how bad the world was morally and in so many ways. But nevertheless, also, we still have righteousness exalted the nation. We might need to say, well, what is righteousness? Well, David said, all of thy commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. The closer that the government operates under biblical principles, the more we can say that God will exalt it. And how desperately our nation needs help today is obvious to anyone who's anchored in the Bible. Now, when I say that, I realize that this were 1924, you could say the same thing. <laughs> and imagine if it were 1864, in the midst and toward the end of the great civil war, what it would be. What we don't realize sometimes is that back in those days in the South, much of the preaching that was against staying in the United States, not seceding, or seceding, I should say, was done by the denominational churches. And thus, when the Union armies would come in and take a place, 
And they would very much have their people going into the churches and listening to what the preacher was saying. Because many of them preached vehemently on secession. There's a record of, you know, Nashville, Tennessee was possessed by the Federals, by the Confederacy, by the Federals, by the Confederacy. It went back and forth quite a bit. And the Federals sent out an officer to listen to David Lipscomb, faithful gospel preacher, and it's really a starter, in fact, of the gospel advocate, to see what he was saying. And the report came back from that officer and said, well, I can only say that he's for Jesus Christ, and very much so. Because he believed what? What Paul wrote. I preach Christ and him crucified. I know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So whether it was a Confederate government controlling them at one time, or whether it was the United States government during that war, that didn't change the gospel, did it? It didn't change what it ought to be. And yet, do you think people were praying for the governments? It'd be kind of different when here in Texas they seceded. What government are we under? I would say the Christian would have to say, we're under whatever government's in control. I wouldn't know anything else to do but say that. Now, it doesn't get into a discussion in this country of whether once a state becomes a state, it can secede. You know, that's never been settled except the barrel of a gun to bayonet. Somebody said, well, was it settled after the Civil War? And I told Jody a while back, yeah, it was settled. North shot it out of the South. It sure was settled. <laughs> that's the only reason it was settled. But in law, interpretation of the Constitution, that's how the the Constitution was interpreted was at the barrel of the Union armies over the South. Well, what do you do in a case like that? What do you do in a case like that? But there's been other times what we've done in the Revolutionary War. We, we forget those things when things are so divided and things are like, and we say, things sure are bad now. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Your great-grandkids, if this nation's still here, will say how bad things are. Now, can they be worse than other times? Well, of course they can be. I would not want to live through those four years of the Civil War, especially in the South. I wouldn't want to live through the Revolutionary War. Listen, I wouldn't want to be in Texas when Santa Ana was coming up through the country because, you know, he came, you may not know this, he came right through here heading for San Jacinto. How would you like to be here then? I think things would have been pretty bad all the way around in a lot of ways. It's interesting reading the history of Texas. They were so scared after the fall of the Alamo when Santa Ana was coming this way. I think everybody here knows about Bastrop. That some of the later ones coming through came to Bastrop after the news already hit there and said cows were standing in the lot bellowing to be milked. Food was cooked on the table, sitting there never eaten. People just took off. Now, we've never, have you ever experienced anything like that? Closest came to the hurricane, came through here, and everybody just stopped up everything here and had a fit. I ought to tell us how people are. Now, why am I saying all this? To remind us specifically, there's never a time we should be praying for the betterment of this nation. And it can get a lot worse. It can be better. But I know that righteousness is exalted of a nation, and think of how long ago that was said to whom. There was no United States. There was nothing like it is in modern-day Europe or any of that. In fact, that was said before there was even a Roman Empire. So the Bible, I'm glad to say, furnishes us with many helpful directives that will be, can be, a blessing to any civil government on earth in this or any other age. But now I speak to the Church of the Living God and members in particular and where we live here in this state and in this nation. First of all, we who are Christians, as that term is used and defined in the New Testament, not the way people in general use it, but true Christians like Paul and Peter, we should pray fervently 
fervently comes from the idea of feverishly all you've got is being put into it for all the rulers of the world. Holy Spirit through Paul to Timothy said that, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 2. We must have a, a state of mind, an attitude that we must render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Matthew 22. 21. We realize that that stands for rendering into the civil government we're under what is justly theirs. People have asked the question, why should we pay taxes to a government like this when it uses them for this, that, and the other, and all of it's contrary to the truth of God and what we had heralded in the gospel and how we live? Well, the Lord relieved us of that when he said, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. And he paid taxes. We do our part. They will be held accountable for what they do with it. There's where the judgment of nations comes in. But we do our part. We obey the laws of the land. And we honor the rulers, Romans 13, 1. In 1 Peter 2, in verse 17. Well, how do you honor some of these rulers? Well, look at how Paul appeared before Felix and Festus and Agrippa. They were not nice people. They might be qualified to run for certain government offices today in view of what some people think qualifications are. They weren't nice people. Just go back and read what we know of them through history. And yet Paul would say, most noble Festus. He spoke of the office they were in and the fact that it was civil government and the fact that God set up civil government and to oppose civil government is to oppose God. Only when earthly powers contravene, oppose, set aside the will of God should we desist. And they have to impact us directly. If we comply with civil government, we have to sin. We can't do that. As Peter said early on, we ought to obey God rather than man. Acts 5.29. So there should be that disposition. We should, we should be examining things that closely. That means that we have to be aware of what's going on. We have to keep up what's going on in government to a degree. At least to know what's going to be bound upon us. We should be concerned. And we are living in a republic that allows us to an extent to be a part of that government. It's a representative form of government. So in America in particular, we have what Paul never had. Paul, by privilege as a Roman citizen, had great blessings that most of the Roman Empire didn't have. But that doesn't compare with what we have. Because intricately, we are a part of the government. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have everybody in the executive branch, everybody in the judicial branch, in the legislative branch, and all the bureaucrats, faithful members of the Lord's church? I can't conceive of it, really. Some people have actually said we as Christians ought to run for more public offices and all this. Well, in theory, I, I say that too, as I just said. I wish everybody in public office was a faithful child of God. But there's a reality to this whole thing too. And that is realizing that it's not that way and the kind of people you associate with are power people. Think for a moment. Why do you want to be a representative? Why do you want to be a senator? Why do you want to be in any of those positions? Influence. What kind of influence? Powerful influence. Most, that's the reason most of the people in the Senate are millionaires. They've got their money. Now what do you want? Power. I'm not saying that there are people up there who don't care about this nation. They have their view in what ought to be. But it's their view in what ought to be that gets me in trouble with a lot of them relative to their philosophy and viewpoint of religion and so on. I think the greatest thing we can do is be righteous and evaluate, evaluate all things in the light of a rightly divided Bible. And we should never be ashamed to speak of heaven's way, even when it comes to standing before kings, as it were. Psalm 119, verse 46. 
it would be wonderful to be able to go preach the gospel in the Senate or in the Congress or a joint assembly of both. You might not be aware of it, but uh, Alexander Campbell got to do that. He walked in those circles. I have a copy of his address on war that he delivered to the combined houses of the United States government. It's very interesting. Can you conceive of that today? Secondly, we must contribute pure, godly, Christian lives of good influence before our neighbors and to improve our society. That's probably where we can impact things more and more is how we deal with our neighbors. Now, I recognize you can re live around people a long time, have very little more than how do you do type of relationship. And, and some of them you don't know what you would do. But nevertheless, it still demands as the leavening for good in the world and the light of the world that we make sure that we're living as the Bible teaches before the Lord, which means we'll try to study the Bible with them. We'll try to get them to come to worship services with us. We'll do something or the other to try to influence them for the cause of Christ. I want you to think of what's said in the fourth chapter of Philippians. I won't read it all. There are some salient points that are contained in that chapter that has to do with my life, my attitude, how I set my life out before others. And those in, in school, think of your stu the students, fellow students in your workplace where you can be what God says you ought to be. But here in chapter 4, these points are, verse 4, joy and happiness. That ought to be a part of you. Or to be exhibited over the right things. Verse 6 speaks of gratitude, being thankful. Verse 5 means moderation. In your life, in your choices, and what you do. Verse 7 is contentment. If your neighbors see you or your work buddies see you or your students see you, other family members even, do they describe you as a contented person? Peace is mentioned in verse 7. Or I believe that's right, verse 7. Then he talks about being pure, noble thinking. Thinking correctly. Is that evident by your actions before all the people you're around? And then, of course, all of this works into exemplary conduct, verse 8. Such put to practice in our everyday operations may not seem that it's going that far in influencing people. But we, we influence like leaven influences dough. A little bit gradually here and there all over and you realize then that this will bless your family your friends your neighbors whoever your workmates your student friends and as galatians 5:23 against these things there can be no law how can you have too much joy and happiness too much gratitude too much moderation too much contentment too much peace of mind coming through. You know that you're acceptable to God. We sang that song a moment ago. Talked about you know where you stand with God. I asked a young man who's in his early 20s. I've got to know a little bit. As I walked in the door of the establishment, I said, have you been good today? He said, yeah, somewhat. I said, somewhat won't cut it he smiled. I kept walking. Anything you can say that might catch somebody's attention or that you can do, just being courteous. We don't live in too courteous a world. It's getting to be a strange thing. Used to, we talk to our children and says, now, please and thank you. You might get, get out of my way. You might have that or I'll run over you, that kind of thing. Little things like that we do not realize do influence this world. And if you get enough people doing it, you influence for good. Righteousness, that's part of right, being righteous, exalteth a nation. Thirdly, we can improve our nation 
immediately by clearly obeying or obeying the clear words of Christ in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus taught us three fundamental issues for success. You know what they are. Love God with all you are and all you have. That's the first commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then one that we fail to realize, although we mention it time to time, do you love yourself like you ought to love yourself? There can be a self-will, selfish love, but there will also be a scriptural love. I would say anybody that desires from the heart to become a Christian, and all the Bible describes Christian to be, <coughs> to live the Christian life, certainly is loving himself or herself like they ought to. When you want to be saved, and you know Christ is the only Savior, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. And you want to place your life into his hands through your trust in him and his gospel. Now that's loving yourself like you ought to. <clears throat> if you could just get that over to your children and nothing else. If they would just believe that and exercise it. Look what you would do. We would like to see great sweeping changes. Immediately. Well, we didn't get in the mess we're in immediately. It's taken years and years and years to get this country where it is from where it used to be. And by the way, if you went back to where it used to be, it never was probably what we remember it and think it was. It doesn't mean it wasn't better in, generally, in general speaking, morally and so on. But there's always been bad folks. All you have to do is study history to realize it. So there's always going to be a need to pray for this country, for Christians to be what God intended them to be as the leavening for good in this world and thus any nation, wherever they might be. We live in a hellish age. I think that best sums it up. And everybody needs to understand that, first of all. What kind of an age am I living in? Now, are we conditioning our children to live in that age? Are they being taught and trained? Because it won't be long for all of us, regardless how much longer we have in this life, to go. And all this is left to them. What are they going to do with it? As I've asked over a period of years here, 20 years from now, if a religious group of people are still meeting this building, what will they believe? And you can ask that of any church around. And yet when you look at the churches around you, go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I promise you the people in them today aren't where those people were 50 years ago, even in the denominations. Because of the general drift of the country and morals and other things. So this will cause each one of us, each individual, to see one's own worth as well as one's own value. That's the reason these fights against abortion, euthanasia, and all these things are so important. What are we instilling within our children that they will understand these things? We could never have a typical, quote, welfare state, unquote, because each one would be unselfishly laboring to help others. Now, if that's not a rudimentary part of godly living in the church that impacts not only our families but the whole of this country, if you got that across, what a difference that would make. If any will not work, neither let him eat. Put that into practice in your home. Put that into practice in the nation. Folks, that would have wide sweeping impact. There was a time, if you talk about going back to time, where that ethic was more of a part of the fabric of this country. Now, that kind of thing, you can see definite changes, among others. And we as Christians, though, can show that we believe that by putting it into practice. If any will not work, neither let him eat. In fact, the challenge of 
what's taught in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10 will always be ringing in our minds, our consciences, we might say ringing in our ears. Whatsoever thy hands find to do, do it with all your might. What message is that? Go to work. Do whatever you can do. Pull your own weight. Be of a worthwhile contribution to society. That's not what being, what's being taught in this country for years. Yet this is a part of being faithful to God. You don't think about that being a principle of God for our conduct and being faithful, but it is. It is. It's a direct affront to laziness. And how can a person be faithful to God and be lazy? That must be put to death. It must be crucified with the old man. There must be the steadfast loyalty to duty. And that would be the crown of our lives. You don't see that. Loyalty and duty. Fulfilling your end of the bargain. Your word is your bond. That kind of thing is as much of being godly as anything. And yet look at the nation. But we as Christians should exemplify that above and above anybody else. Because we're following the steps of our Lord. Galatians 6, 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. Think of what all well-doing is. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That doesn't have to, have to do, it doesn't begin and end with the worship assembly, what the church is and its organization, work, and so on. That has to do with what the family's obligation is. Being a Christian overflows from the family. A father raising his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is doing that because they're Christians. They're faithful. And they're teaching this kind of thing. Carry your own weight, be responsible, uh, be honest. Be true to your word. Be willing to admit you're wrong. Accept your responsibility. Where'd all that come from? It comes from God. It has to do with Christian living. It has to do with leavening influence by such conduct to all those round about us. We many times think about and pray about and comment about Things, if it's, if it's it's over there and that needs to be done and we have a bad habit of saying, they need to do this. They need, this is something I can do right now and do every day to make this nation a better nation. Now, it used to be in the public schools you'd hear things taught like this. We had time, especially, I can remember in grade school in particular, when you'd be taught those things, object lessons. But that's not being done anymore. If anything, it's... Brought the opposite of nothing being said. But we still have that obligation. We're still the family of God and brothers and sisters in particular. And we can help the nation by being what God says Christians ought to be. Finally, and I don't pretend to be covering all of them, and you can take each one of these and get down to more specifics as to what they mean. These are general principles. But finally, every nation on earth will be enriched by people who carefully, and underscore that word carefully, manifested the charge that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. In everything give thanks. How thankful are we? How appreciative are we? Remember, one of the marks of the Gentiles giving up God is they cease to be thankful. It's so easy to live in a nation that God has providentially in his bountiful love and grace given to us that few have ever known on this earth. And because we've reached this station of material ownership and all the things that go along with what our nation has been. But have you ever noticed man's never really satisfied? We want more. Let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we have to have a Garden of Eden on this earth before we can be righteous before God, before we can be faithful. We're expecting to change this, this world. God lays that upon our shoulders. Preach the gospel to every creature and live righteous lives. Remember, 
Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is reproach any people. These are things we can do. The question of Jesus in Luke 17, 17 still comes down to us through the centuries. Remember the ten lepers? They came, they were healed. Out of the ten, one came back and thanked the Lord for it. Remember what Jesus said? He asked him a question. Where are the nine? Will we, the, will we be the one? <laughs> but the question is, today in this country, where are the nine? Well, I don't have to be a part of the nine. I can be appreciative. I can be thankful. Just think of what we have in material things to, for which to be thankful. But above all, what we have to be thankful for is the salvation that we enjoy in Christ. There are billions of people on this earth. Among all of those who are accountable to God, which reduces that number somewhat, taking into account those not responsible and innocent children, think just for a moment how few of those who are accountable to God are genuinely faithful to God and the Lord's church. We have that. It's not by an accident. Look what God has done for us to give us the privilege of basking in His grace and mercy as His children. To be the influence through the truth lived in our lives to our nation. The greatest good we can do for this nation is to be godly. And to be aware of what's going on. I'm not saying we're not. But I'm saying don't let the evil get us down. We could turn the world upside down. Acts 17, 6, from the world's perspective, we're going to be turning, as you know, right side up. With the sunlight of God's love radiating in our lives and our daily conduct, acting under the authority of Christ, knowing who we are. And then in the proclamation and defense of the truth. And how deeply this old earth needs to see the joy of our salvation to the Lord. We see this bumper sticker. It's been around for a long time. It's a good one, but it's been said so much, most people just look at it and go on. God loves you. You realize there's a host of people out there that feel burdened down and broken down that are in all sorts of disrupted families and they have a battle all day long every day. Children in homes that know no security, that are abused. And we need to sound out to them regardless of all those things. God loves you. And he stands ready to accept you on his terms if you will but trust him in his way of salvation and his son Jesus Christ. It makes a world of difference to face the plight that faces all mankind, whatever nation they're in, whoever they are, young or old, rich or poor, or whatever. When you know you're accepted to God and you're ready to meet your maker, it removes all kinds of turmoil. So what can you do to help this country? Well, anybody going to run for president? That's the only way we can do it. Run for representative or senator? You're seeking to be a judge? Well, those things are beyond most of us. Don't know it would be the best way to go anyway as far as what's most advantageous. But we can be where we are as God intended the church to be in the influence for good around the people that we live around all the time. That's the way he meant it to work. Do you realize that the Greek reads, when it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that the Greek literally re reads, as you are going, preach. In other words, you're going Wherever you go, maybe it's because of business. 
Maybe it's because of whatever you're going. We don't read that way in English a lot of times. But it says, as you are going, preach the gospel every Christian. In other words, you preach it regardless. Do you see that view carried out? What happened after the death of Stephen and the persecution that arose? Only the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And they went everywhere what? As they went, preaching the word. As they went, they preached. The very thing that caused them to have to leave, they preached. And that's the way it is with us. If we understand what we ought to, where we are as we're going, maybe the job's transferring you somewhere. Does that stop you from being godly? But if you would help these nations, I invite this nation or any other nation the person might be in, who might be hearing me over the Internet, you be what I just described. First of all, become a Christian. Don't be satisfied with false religion. Examine yourself. Know you're right with God. Don't fall for human churches, the doctrines of men. Obey the gospel, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Then begin to work and assemble in worship with those who have done likewise, for the Lord adds you to His church. And then be righteous wherever you are. And you will be delivering a tremendous impact for good on whatever nation you are and any of the people around you by the example of godly living that you show forth. As a child of God, you probably... Well, you know, probably you do. You hurt the cause of Christ not being faithful. So you need to repent of whatever sins are stopping you from those things, whatever it may be, one or more. Confess them to God and pray for forgiveness. Thus, we offer this invitation. And you know, we could almost say, yes, this is offered to people who need to write their lives with God, but it's offered also to all of us who may not need to necessarily respond as we normally say. But in our minds respond, I want to help this nation. Therefore, I'm going to renew my mind to being a Christian. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.